World War II shaped the lives of a generation. The war broke families apart, brought communities together, and turned a depressed economy into an industrial machine. On the home front, citizens sold war bonds and collected scrap metal for the factories. Friends were made and lost as a generation of boys was sent into combat. Penn State Public Broadcasting invited those who lived this history to share their stories of World War II. My name is Noemi Loibel, L-O-I-B-L. I was born and raised in Rome, Italy. I lived there all through the war years until I met a very good-looking American soldier and made a turn of my home. My recollection of Mussolini a power, I don't think I could make any difference until I came to this country and realized what dictatorship is and what a democracy is. People often would ask me what was fascist like, I say compared to what? Until now, I had no idea. You didn't ask questions, you just took everything as they was told you to do. I really can't tell you that there was there was no, no uh, abnormalcy in my way of life. I mean, everything was pre, in school you did what you were told to do. Um, rules were very strict. You had to belong to the fascist party or you could not get a, a job or you couldn't even go to school. Uh, every Saturday we had to wear uniforms because we had to parade. And every time Mussolini made a speech in Piazza Venezia at the balcony, we had to be there. So there was nothing spontaneous about it. We had, we had to do it. Um, the country was, Italy was not a rich country. Um, there's a big difference between then and now. But everybody was very orderly and you never criticize the government or anyone else. Radio was controlled and so was the newspaper. Of course, there was no television. Um, I don't think I saw a great deal of change until 1943, and that's when I think everything started falling apart, really and truly. First three years of the war, they were rather, they were where it was over there, it was somewhere else. But July 19, 1943, Rome was bombed for the first time. Every age used to go on every night and every day, we kind of got, you know, nonchalant about it. They're going somewhere else. They're bombing Naples, they're bombing Livorno, or something where a uh, uh, military objective. But when Rome was bombed, it made a point to say, you know, wake up. The air raid lasted three and a half hours. I was in school when we all went into the air raid shelter. When uh, the all clear sign, we went home. It was a different world. It was smoke in the air, there were papers flying around, people were disenchanted, they were, I kept walking, and my, my home was a distance away from where I went to school. I went to an old girls' school. It was quite a distance from where I lived. And I had to take a bus and a streetcar to get back and forth, where there were nothing was functioning. And the closer I got to where I lived, the worse it became. The railroad tracks looked like pretzel. Uh, there were dead horses. Buildings had collapsed and you could hear people crying and you could see different things. That it, it, it made you wonder what it was going on. I mean, we knew what was going on, I knew. But the closer I got to my home, the worse it seemed to be. And I met with two other girls that were going home the same way and it was a gentleman who was coming up from the other side of the road and he saw us, he came up and started crying. And we thought, we all started crying. We thought, oh God, everybody's dead. And then he said, no, our building was okay, but the one next to it had been totally. You see, when there is bombing, if you want to hit the railroad, and then collateral damage that happens. And those buildings were not that close, but they were close enough that we, we had quite a lot of damage. Shortly after that, we escaped. We went out to the country and then we had to take a, there was nothing was moving, no, no railroads, no, no buses, there were no cars. 
very few. But when we got out to the country, we thought we'd be safe and just start trains would come down if we were out in the field and there was strafe people that were running. Maybe they thought, you know, they were, we were soldiers, I don't know, but this were Allied planes. You could tell who they were from the sound of the motor. We became to know the sound of the liberators. But we stayed out, out in the country for a few months and then we heard that Mussolini had escaped, the king had abdicated, and Italy signed a separate peace treaty with the Allies, so we thought it was safe to come back to Rome. That was a mistake, but because the Germans had taken over and the things were really tough then. You had to be careful where you went, what time of the day, there was curfew. Uh, in the summer it was nine o'clock in the evening, you had to be in the house. Um, in the winter it was six o'clock, unless you had a special pass, like doctors and priests and people that worked travel, like my father, he did a lot of traveling. Um, we watched German soldiers going in and taking prisoner, anyone that was listening to the radio. There was a, a transmission that came from London at 11 o'clock at night. And the only way you knew, you had to have a shortwave radio. And it went, Beethoven Fifth Symphony, da 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 da. Then you knew that they were coming. We used to listen to the news and the progress of the war. And God forbid, the Germans used to go around with a, a, a jeep that was armored, and they had an antenna. They picked up the signal. They would go up in the building, up and down, and knocking every door. Or you could shut it off, knowing that the danger was approaching. But it all had to do put a hand and feel that that was warm. And if you were caught, you were taken out. There was no, you know, not, not to waste. They don't want to know any reason. You were just listening to something you were not supposed to. Um, Jewish people started beginning taken away from Italy. They had never been bothered before. But they went into the synagogue and took all the gold and everything that was of value and they stripped it. And we used to watch the trains. We used to, during the day, sometime go full of people that you couldn't see them, but you could hear them crying. So we assume we were either prisoners of war or there were Jewish people that were taken away. We were afraid. We didn't talk to the German soldiers. We were afraid. We never did. We, there was no camaraderie, camaraderie between them and, and the public. There really wasn't because they were very stern and they made you know that they were the boss and you had to be in your best behavior. And they were very disciplined. I mean, they really did not want to communicate with anyone. That was my impression. But then I was 16 years old and I, I was afraid because I didn't know. I really and truly never, never talked, spoke to anyone because if you made friends with a German soldier, Italian guys, if you were around, they would take you aside and shave your head because they would say you were uh, you fraternized with the enemy. I mean, the Germans were never, German soldiers were never looked well upon to begin with. But after September the 8th, 1943, then we became, we became invaded like the other country. And we weren't treated any different than people in Poland or Yugoslavia or anywhere else. We were the enemy. One day, my mother and I, I was going to school. Schools were closed because of the, uh, war and transportation wasn't easy, the, the rooms were not heated. So they allowed those that could afford it to take private tutors. And I laid the last three years of my high school, I did it in 16 months with private tutors. In Italy, you carry a lot more uh, matricular than you do over here. I always told my children they had it easy, they took five solid, they were done. We would have maybe 10, 12, 13, whatever. In which grade that you went up more increased. You carry two languages all the way to eighth grade. When you got to eighth grade, you had the choice between English and German, and English and German, German was obligated to take. English was abolished because of the war. But I remember this one day, my mother and I were in, in Rome and where the stores were, looking for a pair of shoes for me for school, trying to hope we could get a black market. We were near Via Viaracella, which was the headquarters for the Gestapo. Someone threw a bomb. There were a group of German soldiers going by, and there was a bomb thrown. 
32 German soldiers died. The police came immediately and started taking all the civilians. They went up and down the building. and every My mother and I were fortunate enough to run into a, a church. We stayed there for the longest time. We didn't know what happened. We did hear the, the marching of the, we knew there were soldiers, but we didn't know what happened. We heard the explosion, people screaming and yelling. And the police car, you know, come down, they had that sound like all the ambulance do, they would do 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 do. We went in the church, I think we were there for several hours. We finally come out, then we learned the next day. The rule was, 10 civilian <clears throat> for every German soldier because, you know, the underground was really giving the problem. They, uh, they um, rescued pilots. They had been, you know, shut down by, by the Germans. Uh, they were hiding different people. No one knew what happened until the next day the underground paper made a big issue out of it. It was a big issue. 360 some people. It's supposed to be only 320, but they went and they cleaned up all the few people, they were petty criminal, they were in a, a jail in Rome, and they took them to also they killed the witness. They made them the grave, they shot them behind the head. And do you know how we found out? People start smelling something terrible after the Germans, after the American troops came in. It was a horrible smell around Rome, and I mean, it was everywhere. And they started in the gate, in that, they started to find out, can't keep the word now, find out what happened. And they went to the Fasia di Athene and they start uncovering all those bodies. Now it stands a memorial. And when I took my children back to see, I made sure that they would see this memorial. 360 some graves, they all have beautiful stones and epitaph. Um, I told them this is what one human being can do to another. July 19, 1943 will always be forever in my, in my mind. Um, you know, they talk about post-trauma stress. I feel sorry for those young men and women that come back from Iraq. I know what it is. I am 81 years old. This had all happened when I was 16. It's never left me. It's with me all the time. And I always think what a wonderful day it was, June 4, 1944, when we saw the first American troops come to liberate Rome. It was six o'clock in the morning, my dad woke me up and he said, do you want to go see the Americans? I said, sure. We went out and we were right in the middle of the Rome and we watched them come in. They were dirty, they were tired, but they were a wonderful sight. And I still remember seeing General McClark I had a little hanky in my pocket of my jacket because it was early in the morning and it was cool. One of the soldiers wanted it and my dad pushed me back and said, don't touch. <laughs> but there was, they were welcome. They were really welcome. They was a wonderful. Things didn't get very much, they were, very, were, were not much better after, but we didn't have to worry about, you know, men and women being taken away. We didn't have to worry about air raids any longer or things like that. There wasn't any more food than it had been before. And I left. I met my husband in 1944. I was my way to school. I think it was the end of August or the beginning of September. I can't, can't remember that too sure. And I was taking a shortcut. And I saw this GI working on one of those wagon. And he looked up. And I looked at him and he said something. I don't know what it was because I certainly didn't understand. I know I got red in my face and I kept on going. And I, but I kept going back to the same spot, taking the same road to school. And my dad came home one day and he said, are you still taking the shortcut to the station of St. Lawrence? And I said, why dad? He said, I don't want you going there. It's full of American soldiers. Well, that was when one year and come out the other. A year later, we were married. I guess a lot better if I had married a German soldier, but they were not really that enthused about it until I wore them out. And they said, well, you have to finish school, which I did do. My ambition was to be a teacher. And of course, I had to go to um, 
the university, and I didn't do that. But I kept teaching myself. I taught myself English. Yes, it is. I know my children kid me. And I said, what's the matter? Don't you understand English? Is that English? You know, you're real smart. But I have um, made it my business to learn a great deal about American history. I'm really fascinated by this is a young country. I hope nobody takes it for granted. Because, you know, you become powerful. Look what happened to the Roman Empire. So you can't take things for granted. I'm glad I met my husband. It wasn't easy in the beginning to come from Rome to Altoona, Iowa City. I traded her the Colosseum for the Hershey Curve, but I gained so much more. I think I give my children a better chance. My husband had spent some time in Italy. They had picked up some Italian, but he had also came from North Africa where they spoke French, and I had six years of French, so we managed. I don't know how well we communicated, but we were married, so you know things got pretty well. My parents were not very happy, and I know in the beginning, and then we kind of wore them out. You know, I would see the hammer or no one else, and beside in Italy, there was no one that was over 16 years of age or under 65, and I didn't want to be an old maid. I was 17 years old, and I worried about being an old maid. Because in my generation, you only had choice. You become a seamstress, you become a nun, or you get married. Well, I didn't want any of those choices, and I was glad that my parents could afford to send me to high school. Because most of People my age, if they have fifth grade of elementary school, that's all. And I wanted to be a teacher more than anything else. And my parents were able, because in Italy, schools were very expensive. When I met my husband, I was looked down on. A lot of my friends were, didn't, didn't approve of it. But then there were so many war brides when I, you know, that I feel I wasn't alone. And I didn't regret it. I don't regret it. You're very welcome. I hope I touched the bases that were interesting to you and that I think it's, you know, it's worth remembering for me. Some of them are painful, but some of them are, are great.